Uh, my name's Jake. I, I do work with the Behavioral Insights team. I'm uh, somewhat humbled to be in front of a room of designers uh, and to have a presentation that I think lacks the word design entirely. Um, so sorry in advance for that, but as I've heard the first two speakers, I actually think uh, what I have to present um, has like meaningful consequences for design. So I invite you all to kind of um, stretch and think about how this might apply, or if it doesn't, just tell me at the end. Um, so I am here with the Behavioral Insights team. Let me just detour briefly. Um, Dan captured exactly right. We started off in 2010 as the original sort of nudge unit um, in the British national government. Our remit in, uh, as the nudge unit was to apply behavioral science to public policy and then test rigorously uh, if that actually worked or not. Since 2010, um, we've had the great opportunity to expand way beyond the British government. Um, we have uh, offices in five countries and projects in 25 or so countries. And we've expanded our remit too, um, to sort of what's on this slide and, and which I think does connect with design, right? So the key idea is, can we design programs and policies that take into account how people actually behave as opposed to how we wish people would behave? Um, I, I'm sure designers are familiar with that challenge um, in the room here. So uh, to kind of get into it, I'd like to start with an actual game, if, if you all are, um, are up for it. I think my idea of a game might be different from your idea, but, um, but here we go. So this is a game that's uh, memory-based and will eventually involve writing down some words. The first thing I'm going to do is show a big list of words, and without writing them down, I'm just going to ask you all to look for about 15 seconds and memorize as many of them as you can using just your mind. Ready? Here we go. 15 seconds. I'll keep the time. Five more seconds. And done. OK, now um, normally we might do this with paper and pen, but I'll say phone or computer. Take out your local notes program, whatever thing you could use to write, and write down as many of those words as you can remember. Give about 20 seconds for this. About five more seconds. Can feel the mental energy from here, it's great. Okay, all right, let's call that the end of writing. And now um, we're gonna see how you all did. So by a show of hands, uh, if you have the word snore, raise your hand. All right, that's all right. It's like maybe a quarter of folks. Um, who has the word wake written down? Oh, even a little more, okay, like a third at least. How about blanket? Any takers? Quarter, quarter, maybe low compliance on the game overall. Nap? That's maybe a third, maybe a third. Sleep? Oh, better, like half. Okay, great. Um, if you said sleep, maybe you were dreaming because it was not there on the list. <laughs> Thanks for playing our game. Uh, so uh, if you did mention sleep, though, you're in good company in replications of this experiment, not just in workshops, but in actual labs. Um, about half of people falsely remember the word sleep. And why do we falsely remember it? Uh, of course, because it's implied by all the other words on this list, right? So even though sleep is not here, um, the words are certainly in that constellation around sleep. And for that reason, our brains kind of fill in that word for us, uh, despite it's not being there. So that uh, game gives one example of this sort of um, principle that, that we're referring to when we talk about behavioral science. And that is the principle that um, our brains do all kinds of things uh, generally on our behalf, but they sort of fill in gaps. Uh, they fill in information that's missing. They form opinions. They reach conclusions um, without our conscious effort. Uh, that's no surprise to anyone who's you know, spent a day in the real world, but, um, but it did come as a surprise to the discipline of economics, which for many years kind of modeled human decision making as a rational, logical, step-by-step -step action. We would look at the alternatives, consider each one one by one, and choose the one that sort of had the greatest value or something like that. 
um, using the visual aids here on this slide. Uh, traditional economics kind of saw us as Spock type creatures that, um, that applied a rational approach to almost any choice. Um, behavioral science in the way that we want to practice it just wants to update that model so that we're no longer Spock but we're like a little more like the guy in the bottom picture. So someone who's trying to drive to work, take a call, answer an email, drink coffee and eat a sandwich um, all at the same time, without crashing, with limited information, stressed, with sirens in the background, et cetera, right? We're, we're trying to design for a person who, um, who is distracted, who has limited attention and limited cognitive resources. And what the science will tell us is that people's minds work very differently under these conditions. Um, and, and the kind of key piece of theory here um, is what's called the dual process theory of cognition. So uh, this is the last little piece of theory I'll do, but, but let me say what we mean by this dual process theory of cognition. We mean there are two ways, um, two ways that all of our brains work. The first way is sometimes called system one, and it's the sort of fast, intuitive, effortless bit of thinking that our brains do. Uh, system one is what filled in the word sleep on that uh, list that you saw. System one is uh, what provides the answer to two times two. System one is the thing that makes sure I stand near the third post in Metropolitan Avenue subway stop because I know exactly that's the right door to get off of. Even if I were um, you know, uh, juggling three balls and having a phone call, I would still just get to the third post as if by a magnet. That's system one working um, completely sort of outside my conscious effort. So we all have system one. The other system is system two. It's the other side of the coin. System two is the kind of thinking you're doing when you know you're thinking. If I ask you to calculate the square root of 209 and you start to feel the wheels turning, that's system two happening. Uh, if you have to plan a very detailed you know, event or project and put the steps together, that's going to be system two. Um, the important thing to know is we all have both systems. We're not one person or the other person. It's just that those systems come to life at different moments. And the kind of big contribution from behavioral science writ large is, um, is that the environment, more than ourselves, or, or maybe more than we'd like to think, determines whether we use system one or system two. So if we could all flip a switch on our own behalf and say, now I'm gonna be a system one thinker, now I'm gonna be system two, that would be great, but it doesn't work that way. Um, the things that we interact with, the spaces that we're in, um, the, you know, the interface on the website that we are navigating, that um, and those environmental features do a great deal to push us into system one or system two. And so here's where I think is a really neat uh, connection with design, is that that presents then an opportunity, right? Anytime you're presenting a place or an interface for a person to interact, um, you have some control over the mental state they're going to bring to that interaction. And consequently, you have some opportunity to influence the outcome. Um, so that's sort of what we think about in a big sense when we apply behavioral science to areas of public policy or social impact kind of questions broadly. So that was a lot to throw out in a few minutes. I'm gonna spend the remainder um, just talking about two sort of examples uh, where we've done this in the field. Um, and I'll kind of connect it with, uh, with these concepts a little bit. If I can advance the slide, which I can. Am I? Oh, thank you. Um, so when we go to apply these concepts, we uh, sort of use this four-step framework if you want to design something with system one, system two in mind, you should make it easy, make it attractive, make it social, and make it timely. Um, in a longer presentation, I would like go into great detail about what each of those means. For now, I'll sort of put it out there, um, invite questions at the end if you're interested, and the examples I share will hopefully say a little about each. So the first example I want to talk about has to do with antibiotic prescriptions. Um, this is a piece of work we did with the Department of Public Health in England. Uh, they were uh, taking on a national campaign to reduce antibiotic prescribing. And the motivation behind this was concern about antimicrobial resistance, 
Um, you know, we have germs, diseases. If we overprescribe antibiotics, then those diseases evolve to resist the drugs we have. So on the margin, we'd like to prescribe a little bit less, even though we don't want to um, keep, you know, life-saving drugs out of anyone's uh, hands. So that's the sort of big problem. Um, traditional public health approaches would involve, like, retraining doctors so that they prescribe a little less or maybe revising the prescribing guidelines to encourage people to be uh, you know, a little stingier with antibiotics. We had the very radical idea of like, let's not do any of that, let's just send a letter. So that's what we thought. We thought maybe if we send a really, really good letter, we could change uh, prescribing of antibiotics. So we thought about what's a really good letter, and we, um, and we brought in kind of two areas from behavioral science. Uh, this is a picture of the letter, although you can't read the particulars, I'll call them out. Um, we had this one sentence, the great majority of practices in London prescribe fewer antibi antibiotics per head than yours. So the first thing we did was just clue into the very uh, obvious um, fact that we care what our peers do. That's what the S in, in East, that's what the social stands for. Um, we care about social norms. So we flagged for um, these letters, which we sent to the top 20% prescribers, um, we flagged for them that you're actually prescribing much more than most other doctors. So uh, the behavioral insight there was social norms and peer comparison. The other thing we did um, was we gave these three clear steps. So uh, one behavioral insight that we um, are applying here is that you want to minimize the distance between that moment of motivation and opportunities to act on that. Um, and so that's what we were trying to do in this case. We said, all right, maybe we've kind of poked through to doctors' attention um, with the social norms you know, reference. Um, let's now immediately give them something they can do to be better prescribers, or three things they could do. So with this letter, um, we wanted to test it rigorously. As I mentioned, we're um, sending to the top 20%, the sort of high prescribers of antibiotics. We did a, a live A-B test, as it were. So we took half of that group, sent them this new letter. Uh, the other half of the group, we just monitored for control. So before we sent the letter at all, um, the prescribing rates were equal between the two groups. Then we started sending the letter in October. Um, immediately, the treatment group, uh, you know, sort of started prescribing less than the control. Over the five months that followed October, that gap persisted, even though prescribing rates changed seasonally. So this happens, I guess, every year around Christmas. We all go home, get our families sick, everyone goes to the doctor. So there's this predictable spike around um, December to January. But what's important to see is like the treatment group is lower throughout the whole time. The letter is doing its work and uh, knocking down prescribing rates this whole six months. And then by this time, by the end of March, we were convinced like the letter is great. It's doing something uh, meaningful here. So we're like, let's finish the test and let's just start sending the letter to everybody, including the control group. And we were then satisfied to see prescribing rates uh, in the control group went down as well. So we sort of confirmed that the letter worked how we hoped it did. Um, just to reference back to those uh, original principles, I think the ideas here are social. We mentioned to doctors that their peers are prescribing less than they are. They might want to fall in line. Um, we also wanted to make it easy for doctors to act on that information. So we gave them these concrete steps to take. Um, Looking at the time now, I'm inclined to not to do the second example. I think it'll take us through the Q&A period. So I think I'll stop there um, and invite questions, if that's all right. Thank you, Jake. Uh, so raise your hand, as always. Oh, that was easy. Hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm curious to know uh, some examples of maybe these behavioral interventions not quite working as expected, and what were the learnings from that, and whether or not you kind of decided that that population was either not right for this intervention, or kind of what were the next steps after that? And I'm asking because I've run into this personally. <laughs> yeah, um, great question. So we do see backfires. Um, we see them... 
I want to say fair, like occasionally, um, maybe in a tenth of all cases, we have something where we think um, we have a kind of behavioral principle that works and we actually throw it out there and it doesn't. I'll give one concrete example. Um, we were working with the uh, city of Oklahoma City on a uh, basically a public messaging campaign to get folks to sign up for a program um, that supported subsidized ambulance rides. God, that is such a mouthful. It was getting people to donate a little money so that other Oklahoma City residents could take an ambulance ride when they needed it. Normally, we've had a really, uh, we've had good luck sort of simplifying communications, sending something out there where the ask is very clear, the, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's visual, it pops, you make the request quickly, um, and you sort of blast that out and tend to get fairly good sign-up rates. In this case, we actually saw a simplified, punchy communication did worse than a sort of formal, um, uh, more traditional city communication. So there it was like, we really thought we had a better idea, we were wrong. When we then went back and parsed through the data, what we, what we think was happening was that this was a program that was unfamiliar to residents and that in this particular case where the, um, where the offer is sort of of uh, questionable value, that people wanna see a formal uh, voice of the city speaking to them. So we thought in that case, like a more formal letter actually makes more sense because people are having trouble assessing the value of this program or its relevance to them. Um, so that's sort of a very particular case where our uh, sort of expectations were reversed. But in general, I think I would make two points. One is we sort of try whenever we can to test these rigorously and then really investigate if it does backfire. And what investigating means in that case is probably going back to the field, trying to interview folks um, who responded differently than we thought they might, try to understand what was going on in those cases. So sort of like follow-up interview um, is a big part of how we parse surprising results. Um, are you at all concerned about this being used for evil? I mean, you basically lied and manipulated these doctors. <laughs> Uh, sorry, are we afraid of them being used for evil and? <laughs> it seems like you lied to and manip manipulated these doctors. Oh, um, let me answer the second question first, because uh, that just means I didn't present it well. We didn't lie to any doctors. We only sent those letters to the top 20% uh, percent of prescribers. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that question, because uh, I should have been clearer about that. Um, broadly speaking, we are... Uh, constantly worried that these will be used for evil, um, mainly out of ignorance. That's, that's really, uh, I don't think I'm misrepresenting the company's position by saying that. Uh, so I think the key, the key sort of realization, and this comes straight out of uh, Thaler and Sunstein's book, Nudge, is this idea that we are, we, if we are uh, designers of public policy, if we're designers of um, digital tools, of websites, of interfaces, then we are choice architects. We're designing environments where people are going to make choices. As soon as we are that designer, we have the responsibility. There is no neutral choice we can make. You will present the information in a certain order, and that order will matter. It will influence decisions. So when I say like we're constantly worried, but I'm mainly worried about ignorance, I think uh, in our work, which you know often centers on sort of working with public sector organizations, think about the th the government forms and the things that you receive, right? A parking ticket, uh, a, a jury duty notice. Who designed that thing, and why, and with what in mind? Like very often, those things are just sort of passed down. It's a series of incidental decisions, or um, you know, someone had to update it to include this new question which is now required by law or whatever. Things get Frankenstein together over time, and that's the, that's the version that reaches us. Um, whether there was an intentional process or any, like, intentional engagement with these ideas, um, I, I guess I'm most concerned about cases where there just wasn't, and we're receiving something that's an artifact of um, just random chance. There are also definitely cases where there are like nefarious actors using these things for bad. Um, 
One instance that's not necessarily bad is the um, there are two rooms left on um, Priceline, right? Like this is a, a a clear nudge to get you to buy that room, but it's like that's a that's a commercial thing, and I'm I'm not saying it's good or bad, but these things are in in practice everywhere. Um, I think my my biggest concern is when people just don't even know they're doing it. So a lot in design, I feel like we're not solving the right problem. My question for you is, are your clients coming to you with their problems? Are you trying to, you know, create this problem or try and figure out what their problem is and create a solution for it? That's a great question. Um, what we usually start with when we start on a process with a, a client is they'll often come to us with a, a really high level problem. They'll say like, in our city, unemployment is a big problem. And so the first thing we'll try to ask is, what's behavioral about that problem? What dimensions of it have this like behavioral science flavor to them? Because certain aspects of unemployment are just structural, like the minimum wage is the minimum wage, or um, the number of companies in the city is the number of companies in the city, and that's what it is. So one of the first things we try to do is like, draw a line around the things that are structural or institutional and say, those are what they are. There may be like political or policy paths to change them, but those are over here. And we try to draw our attention to like where in this process, where in this system are moments of kind of human choice making a difference. And then we zoom in on those moments and say, what can we do there? Jake, thank you so much. We're out of time. That was fantastic. Thank you all. <laughs>